thank you for clicking on The Justin Root Show. I am sitting here with a man of film, television, and theater, Mr. Stan Zimmerman. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for letting me after I hounded you to be on the show. I love it. I'm really overwhelmed to have you here because I could spend the entire conversation... Just talking about the Brady Bunch. And then Golden Girls, and then Roseanne, and then Gilmore Girls, and every project of yours. I could talk for a half hour. And the easily. next one. I, I know, I know. Oh, All right, wait, wait. That's... I, no, I, haven't, I haven't even talked about it yet in public. I think like, I know, okay. but I don't know okay. if I know. Okay. But that's right, going we'll we'll to that. keep people that's from watching. Teaser, yeah. People are going to keep watching. Right. Actually, out of those titles, though, I do want to know. Okay. Film, TV, theater. Which, which is right here in the heart? Theater. I started at seven acting. I begged my mother to take me to a theater school in Detroit, Michigan. And that first time I did it, I remember hearing an audience laugh, and it like shot up my spine. And I was like, I have to do this. Yeah. Somehow this is my life. They said to me, and this is, I was like seven, eight years old, to go out and like to a mall and watch people as, a, as an actor, observe. So right from that young age, I started just observing people. And it has really helped me in my writing because people always say, well, how can you write for old ladies? Or how can, because I'm always watching people and listening or putting myself in their, in their shoes and thinking how they would react. And who are you watching on TV and um, now? No, no, no. no. At this age, the kid. Uh, well, I was obsessed with TV, yeah, and same. it was unpopular. And obviously, I wasn't playing sports. Uh, so, in my uh, bedroom, I created my own TV network. I literally scheduled seven days a week a program against ABC, NBC, and CBS because that's all they were at the time. So, if a show got canceled, I would bring it on my network. Or I was madly in love with Lily Tomlin, and I'm like, why does she not have her own variety show? So on my network, it was she had the Lily Tomlin variety show for an hour. Yes, and I got to tell her that too. It's like, she was like, finally, someone gave me a TV show because <laughs> I loved her TV specials, but I wanted to see her every week. Every week, week. Okay, Carol Burnett. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. so I think I was obsessed with Carol Burnett. Same. So parents, they're like supportive and they're, uh, they're... my father was not really, okay. and my mother always was. Growing up in Michigan. And all my family and relatives had all gone to the University of Michigan, and he really wanted me to just do that. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to bust out of there. And having heard about if you wanted to make it as an actor, you had to go to New York. Right. And so I just got it in my head. I had to go to NYU. And what, 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 what era is this? Uh, this was late 70s. So I was going to school, and then uh, I was dating someone that was Here's a whole other thing I don't know about. I was dating someone who was really good friends with Andy Warhol. Oh, amazing. Yeah, I didn't know that. Uh, so my this, this guy I was dating would say, oh, I have Andy's limo. I'm picking you up at the dorm, and we're going to Studio 54. And I would go with my Jew fro and my fake down jacket. I just felt like an imposter, like I shouldn't be there. But, you know, there I was, and I didn't know who Andy Warhol was. I didn't know any of that uh, in his whole situation. So there's some crazy stories. One day we were sitting like this, yeah. you know, I was probably drinking and who knows, smoking pot or whatever. And this girl sitting where you are started going like miming at this. I'm like, what are you doing? And I look up and there's Andy Warhol taking pictures of me. But you know, if you've ever been in an altered state, for some reason I thought he was taking my soul. So I literally told Andy Warhol <laughs> to stop taking pictures of me. That's how stupid I was. So somewhere in his archives and wherever. Do you think you're probably the only person who's ever told him that? Asked probably, him that? yeah, yeah. So oh, everyone else is like, please, you know. And I'm like, no, stop. I mean, you had to see just everyone then too at Studio Fifty Four. I mean, that was like the it was day. prime. Yeah, yeah. yeah every, and are you? Day. I mean, are you somebody who was starstruck and this is crazy? And I'm a boy from Michigan, or no? I want to be with these people. I want to be in this business. I want to. I, I always believed in myself and knew I would be working in there. I didn't quite know what. I had this crazy imagination. <clears throat> I didn't think I could be a writer because I didn't read. And when I did school papers, you know, I felt like if you were flowery and used a lot of adjectives, you would get better grades. And I didn't want to do any of that bullshit. I would write very matter of fact, which I found when I ended up writing sitcoms was perfect because you have to get to a point in 23 minutes. You don't have to be all flowery. And then I met my writing partner, Jim Berg, in college, and he was studying uh, at NYU uh, journalism. So he came from it from the words. I came it from acting, and everything had to be real and come from character and attitude. So 
he helped me with my words and I helped him bring you know, reality to scenes. Well, what a great segue into uh, that sitcom world. Yes. Golden How Boys. did it happen? And you worked on it the first season, Very first right? season, yeah. So, I mean... Crazy. No one knew anything. Nobody knew. We had done a, a staff job, a pilot at CBS, and then we did a bunch of episodes. We did an episode of Fame that Janet Jackson was in, and Debbie Allen directed it. Jeez. Yeah, and it was uh, Janet's first music video. And years later, I ended up seeing it at Revolver, and I was like, Oh my god, my video's on? Um, yeah, yeah, that was really fun. And then we got a call, would you go meet at this show called Golden Girls? And so you go in and you watch the pilot, and then you uh, have to come back and pitch episodes. And we thought it was hysterical You pilot. did. So you watched it and, you said, and you're not thinking like, oh man, four old ladies. No, oh my god. Well, and also I uh, come from New York and I had just seen... Still getting into her song trilogy, so I was oh. like, I thought she was absolutely oh, brilliant. Okay. So here she was, being hysterical. I knew all the other ladies, mm -hmm. and um, it was just a really funny pilot. And we just like all these ideas came out, and we go back in. You sit on a, again a couch, and you pitch, and they're going no, 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 no. And then uh, we were walking to the door, and in the door jam, something just like clicked, and I turned around and I said. What if Rose's mother comes to visit? I don't know why I said that. I really, I was panicking and I didn't, I wanted the job. And they went, said, come back in and sit down. I don't know why. And we sat down and they just started beating out the story. We're like watching them going, well, what does this mean? And we went off and wrote it and they loved it right away. And um, they brought us on staff right away. And surprisingly, most of our material stayed in the script. Like there's some jokes that I listened to and it's like, they were in literally the first draft. The best thing was when we figured out that B. Arthur didn't need any lines, that she could just like give that look, that look. and everyone, the studio audience would, would just guffaw and, and laugh, and that saved us a lot of time. Mm -hmm. She was, I mean, incredible. Yeah. Just absolutely incredible. How, how were all four of them? I mean, tell me it all. They're, it's Did my it? book, though. Okay. That's out or coming No, out? I want to write a book. Maybe oh. you can help me with it. All right. It's called The Girls from Golden to Gilmore, about all the wonderful, okay. crazy, lovely amazing women that I've gotten to work yeah. with over the years. Yeah. All right, favorite going girl? Well, Estelle. I should have worn my uh, I'm, I'm Sophia Buttons. Favorite character and then favorite actress? Is Estelle an actress or character? Person. Okay. Because she took us under her wing. Really? And she very, you know, you write in a bubble and then suddenly you're on the stage with these people. And I was just so honored because of Torch Song to talk yeah. to her. And right away she pulled us to the side of the stage so no one could see. And she said, um, you're one of us. I thought she meant Jewish, but oh, she meant yeah. gay, because she considered herself gay. <laughs> Not gay, but gay friendly, yeah. and that was her world, oh, all of her, yeah. Wow. And she's like, your secret's safe with me. Because back then, we had to be in the closet, even on the even show. And I know everyone always says, oh, but it's such a gay show. No, it was still an old boys network. Uh, there were two women on staff, Still, our agent said, you know, don't keep it DL. Keep it DL and bring a beard, a woman, to any functions that you have. Yes. We Even as a writer, behind the scenes. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. That is insane. And I remember Jim and I were sharing a house in, um, in Silver Lake, and um, we went to a yard sale, and I think it was someone who died of AIDS and was selling stuff. Well, when the staff found that out, they were like, you got to take those sweaters and burn them. And that was just a different time. Wow. So we were just like, well, we should maybe not talk about any of that. So we were scared. We didn't know anything. We wanted to keep our job. and um, But we always knew like Estelle had our back <laughs> in some weird way. Any, like the other actresses didn't have your back or just didn't acknowledge? Like... Uh, rude to me when you ask about actors. She was the actor's actor. Like she was the only one that came up and talk to us about character and why did you write this and what do you think it needs and she really so when you look she's giving the most performance I think yeah of, of any of them B was always very nervous and didn't really talk to us and I remember one time after a table read we got locked in that locked we ended up in an elevator with I think it was just her and I'm just holding my script like don't look at her face to hope she doesn't talk to me and uh, you know I was really young so I didn't know I just remember looking down and seeing her hairy toes because she didn't wear socks and I, that scared me too so I'm just looking everywhere I could I think her book should just be called B. Arthur Has Hairy Toes yeah yeah I compare it to um, 
Uh, Lord of the Rings. Did B. Arthur and Betty White get along? Um, there was tension. <laughs> yeah, Betty to me is more Sue Ann Niven than she is Rose. Okay. And people may not get that kind of sense of humor. It's, it was so biting and dark in a way that you know I think people can read it different ways. But they're all such strong personalities, especially being in Betty. You know. Um, yes. But there'll be more in the book. What seasons were you on Roseanne? Well, we just did the one season five or six. Oh, okay, I was yeah. going to say four or five, yeah. but you know better. Uh, we passed on the season one. Really? Yeah. I had actually seen Roseanne on The Tonight Show. and I had, The big Johnny Carson one? Yeah, for yeah. some reason I woke up and I'd turn on the TV, which is why I like to have a TV in the bedroom. And I'm like, who is this person? And what she was saying, you had just never heard that point of view before. Mm-hmm. So the next day... I. I called my agent and I said, who is she? Like, I think, like, there's a show in there. And he said, America's not going to want to watch a fat person in the lead. Wow. And I'm like, maybe we shouldn't be at this agency. But that was, you know, back then, it was right. it was all beautiful people starting shows. You just And that's why it was so refreshing. And that's why, I, but they want us to commit to, like, a lot of years. And the elements were all there. And, and now that I've heard all the craziness that went on that first season, I don't know, like, we may have ended up running the show after two weeks. I don't right. know because she kept wanting to fire people. Yeah. And, but I feel like we were meant to wait to be on there and do the lesbian kiss episode. And that was all kind of... And that, that's your it. episode, right? The yeah, 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 the, yeah, yeah. The infamous yeah. lesbian kiss with the lovely Mario Hemingway. Right? Yes. Yeah, so that I was mean, hard to cast that because, <sighs> again, at that time, if you played a gay or lesbian, you would, everyone would think you are. Yeah. I wish to God somewhere the list we made of actors that passed on it. Really? And she said yes, I think, because she had done a movie, Personal Best, and already played one. I was like, oh, well, okay. I've done it. Yeah. And it didn't hurt her career. But there were many, many, many women that just was like, I, I can't, sorry. You know, Roseanne doesn't get the credit, I think, that it deserves for how many walls she knocked down and how many groundbreaking things she did. I mean, not only did you have that lesbian kiss, you had um, Leon's, you had you had a gay character. You already had a, you had a gay wedding. Yeah. You had, there, Sandra not Bernhardt. Sandra Bernhardt. There was, there was yeah. so much, you know, a, a Will and Grace takes a lot of credit. They get, they deserve a lot of credit, yes, but do. Roseanne did so much first. But there would not have been an Ellen or Will and Grace had she not done that. Absolutely. But, she could not have done that if there wasn't a soap. So sure, everyone, for sure. Everyone did, paves the way. Yeah, but for some reason, I don't think enough is given credit to her because of, you know, the, the dirt she likes to kick up. Yeah, but how was that experience? I mean, was it just, oh, God. It was terrifying because there were 21 writers on staff, which is way too many. A lot of uh, Roseanne and Tom, it was, I was there the last year they were still a couple, oh, God. and their relationship exploded. It was hard because they said, don't let Roseanne see the whites of your eyes or she'll fire you. And you, you, we were there the year what when they... What does that mean? What does that, that mean? That if she sees eye you, eye contact, Just, you, who are you? Get him out of here. He's gone. You. So they said, hide behind the tallest person. So I literally took that literally, and I would hide behind my script in front of a big person. And then, which we did for most of the year until we wrote the lesbian kiss episode. And then it was like, hell the hell wrote this guy? Get him down here. And we're like, ah. And we go in there and she's like, tell you, funny. All right, go. And then that was that. But to her credit, when the network said they were not going to air the lesbian kiss episode, Tom and Roseanne said, we're going to buy the episode back. We're going to put it on HBO. We don't care. This is going to be seen. And they did not have to do that. So that's why whatever Misha Goss, I, I get a word. Um, I just am so thrilled that she believed in that cause to, to get that out there. Okay, so we met at the screening of, of the Brady Bunch movie. Yeah. How did that come about? I had a, a trip scheduled to Greece, and I get to Athens, and then uh, a call comes through in my hotel, and it was a man yelling at me. It was actually Betty Thomas. And <laughs> she's like, all right, dude, you want to come back to write this movie? I'm like... Uh, um, okay, I said, you know, give me two days in Mykonos and I'll come back. When we got on it, we were only hired for a two-week punch-up. So they, she said, write it uh, for a little kid that have never seen the show. Write it for the baby boomers that you saw know, the show. Saw, will know every single thing. Okay. And then write it for stoners. And we're like, got it. Like, that was such a cool way to think of it. So we had to wrap, put our minds in that. You know, we didn't get stoned to write it, but yeah. just in, like, what would be, like, just 
crazy stuff to write. And then once we saw she would bring us tapes of, of um, you know, Jennifer Lee Cox. And who was on the show. Who was on this couch, yes, and love her. And when, uh, and Christine Taylor, and we're like, oh my God, these two are like dead ringers. They were, and they just, they got the sound, but they also got the comedy of just twisting it a little bit. Mm -hmm. And we're like, okay, this, we're, we need more of it, more of it, more of it. So then we just like said, all right, well, here we have these crazy ideas. So like, you know, with Carol. I was waiting. Uh, is pouring the sugar. I said, what if he just keeps pouring and talking and talking and pouring? Because that's who she was, just so super sweet. Yeah. Stupid stuff like that. And Betty's like, oh my God, that's great. I mean, it's so silly and ridiculous, but also no one's commenting on it. They're just living it. Yeah, like, yeah. That cast, everyone who worked on that movie nailed it. Nailed everything from art direction to the, I mean, the acting, the cadence of their voices. And, and Shelley, who I just think is absolutely a brilliant actress. Remember where she was in her career at that point. Do you know? She, I know exactly. Okay, where. so you tell me. Yeah. Well, the thing is, and I think she gets so much unnecessary and unfair. I think Hollywood owes her the biggest apology because she got so much shit for leaving a show after five seasons. Five. She didn't pull a Farrah Fawcett. She didn't leave after, you know, the first season of Charlie's Angels. She was there for five years and said, you know what? I want to stretch my wings and go out and Hollywood shit on her. And the media just called her ungrateful and they, they trashed her. And, and supposedly she was really tough on films. You know, it... And I know women get... The I know about more, 500 you know, men who are yeah, tough on no, films. No one says anything. Yeah. No one says shit about it. Yeah. It's like... And what's their idea of tough? She had an opinion? Yeah. Come Why on. was Shelley Long tough? Because she maybe didn't like something? Maybe... I don't know. Or maybe she was an awful person. Who knows? You can tell me. Um, but it was considered a comeback, right? Like Yeah, but we were literally... Betty says, come into the room... <laughs> While I'm talking to Shelly to offer the part, and we were we were on the while lying on the floor, and we're listening. I was on a speakerphone, and she was very frank about it because Betty is just completely honest mm -hmm. and talked about like this is where you are in the business. Wow. But they were friends, obviously, from True Beverly Hills, and she was, I want you for this, but this is, I'm, you know, this. She was like, this is a way you can reinvent yourself. And it kind of an ensemble, too. It's yeah, she Long. said she had to say to her, this is not the Shelley Long movie. Mm -hmm. Are you okay with that? Because yeah. you know, she had been doing starring and things with Batman yeah. or whatever. Yeah. And, you know... Outrageous is, fortune. Yes, yeah, just a little bit like that. Um, are you going to be okay? Like, this is just your piece of this amazing, crazy puzzle. And she was, to her credit, was just like, I'm there. And the thing that really taught me so much, and I have such respect for her, she would come, even when she wasn't on camera, come to be on the other side to do, I'm sure Jennifer. Jennifer Lee's said yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She said that. Because she was smart enough to know, what, for whatever stupid reason, I have this image out there, I'm going to be the team player. And God fucking bless her for doing that. And that says a lot about who she is as a person. Oh, well, the whole RuPaul thing. Yeah, well, to, how'd that come about? So we were reading people like Jennifer Lewis. Like, I kept saying, I feel like some Mrs. Cummings we should bring some ethnicity in it. Like, let's find a great black actress. Mm -hmm. One night I was in West Hollywood at the Revolver, and it all comes back to the Revolver, mm -hmm. and up pops this new video of Supermodel. And I'm like, I put down my martini, I'm like, oh my God, who is this? And I went in the next day and I said, all right, I have a crazy idea. I think you should read this person, RuPaul. And they had, it was only in gay clubs then, remember, it was not even like had exploded into the national consciousness yes. then. And I think she had to get some, made some calls to casting. Can you get this RuPaul person in to me? Matt, he got the job. Uh, I said to Jim, I'm going to the set. And he's like, yeah, you go, whatever. I'm like, I have to be there for that. And it was the guidance counselor room scene. And I'm just, I was like, I don't know. I'm just going to be quiet in the corner. And I'm watching the scene. And then I said, the scene ended. And I said to Betty, okay, this is going to be weird. But when Jan leaves, have Ru say, and girl, you better work. And she's like, why? And I said, just get a take of it, whatever. Just, I just had this weird, like, that was her song. I'm like, I don't know. Like, just, I think it would be funny. She says, well, no one's going to know what it means. I said, but whatever, you'll we'll have it. Then when we're in editing, the song just explodes into mainstream public. And people, everyone knew who RuPaul right. was. And it was so gratifying in the audience at the screening of the, and and RuPaul says that, and everyone's like, ah, and they laugh, and they're like, that felt so good, and I thought, like, that's why you have to show up. I'm so glad that day I, I 
I was there and and got to you know connect all those dots in that scene. Go more girls. Yes. Have you in your life ever seen a show more love than that show? They have these uh, Gilmore Girls fan festivals mm-hmm. in Connecticut. And uh, we're going to go to the third one in October this year yeah. in Kent, Connecticut. You came aboard season five, right? Yes. So Amy Sherman Palladino was our friend from Roseanne. Roseanne yeah. So on Roseanne, she kind of, because we broke into groups, she always requested me and Jim and Lois, the crazy lesbian. And we always wrote all the Darlene Roseanne scenes in the bedroom. Okay. And they were so touching and yeah. wonderful. And I fell in love with Amy right away. She walked into a room full of guys and was just like this scene is bullshit and here's why and this is what she's doing and I'm like she's brilliant and she was brilliant and she would just tell us get in the car we're going to have dinner and I'm gonna we're gonna whine and write a scene and I'm like no but we're gonna be hated and don't we can't leave and the panic but we always came back with cool stuff so uh, we stayed good friends with her and when Gilmore Girls happened she was fighting with the networks and um, not having a great time and we're like why I don't understand and she said, meet me and my husband at the Chateau Marmont. I'm like, okay, we'll do that for drinks. And she said, I want some friends on staff. And she had gone through a lot of writers. And she said, and we were in development and doing that whole thing. My goal that year was just to make sure she had a good time. As a friend and like, you should, this is such a great show yeah. in the writing. Yeah. I had not seen it since the pilot. I had to watch in a weekend four years of it. And I'm like, oh, I can't do it. And then all of a sudden, I'm like eating every meal. I'm going, wow, because it's so, you get pulled into the characters and the actors are so good. I mean, Lauren Graham and everyone, everyone is so fantastic. So uh, we felt really lucky to have been there that year and had a great time and made great friends and wrote some cool things and did an episode with Norman Mailer and um, it was really wonderful. The anticipation of the teaser that you teased me with yeah. that feels like nine hours ago okay. is killing me. Um, tell me what you're working on now. Because I think I know. But I don't what know. do you think you know? Well, I've heard there is a show in the works about an all-male Golden Girls sort of reboot. Silver Foxes, maybe? Yeah, so we did a reading of it. it was Silver Leslie, Foxes, Jordan, Jordan, Bruce Valanche. George Takei, Sherry O'Terry, Melissa Peterman, Daniel Gaither. It was... Tell me everything. Actually, Logo came to us and asked us if we wanted to do a uh, gay men's Golden Girls. And literally in the room, we said, get yeah, done. So we wrote it. And before we handed it in, I said, I know this isn't done. Usually in theater, you have readings. But for sitcoms, you don't. So I didn't know George Decay or Leslie Jordan. I cold called them. I said, I don't have a script. Here's the idea. Here's who we are. Are you available June? Blah, blah, blah. Yes, yes, yes. It was just going to be for us and writer friends to punch up the script before it went in. I'm like, oh my God, these people are coming to my house. I called the network and I said, I know I'm far away from your office. You're in you know, West LA. I think this is like uh, a gay moment you have to see. And they were like, how did this happen? And it was a fantastic reading and it went wonderfully. At the end of the day, Logo doesn't have the money to do scripted. So they gave the script back to us. And so we thought we would... Take it out and people would love it. And uh, no network would read the script. Not read it. Not even open it up. And we found out because they thought, um, which they couldn't say, unless some people hinted at it, it was uh, old characters and gay. So it was a double whammy. And they thought, because they're old characters, only old people would watch. Like Golden Girls? And I kept saying, Golden Girls had every range of people watching. They just couldn't. So then the story switched in the media to that, and I was honest about it. I didn't seek out the publicity, but people were asking questions. I said, well, this is what I'm getting. And so people got very invested in it. A lot of people were like, what can I do? I said, well, you write the networks, you write Hulu, you were not tell them to do it. <clears throat> and God bless them. And I haven't spoken about this yet, but, um, so through social media, I know, um, a company came to the rescue. A uh, company called Super Deluxe, which is financed by Turner, and they optioned the material, and we're rewriting it from a multicam to a single cam, and they want us to make it even edgier and more like like a Grace and Frankie kind of show or transparent. Um, part of our inspiration for it was uh, we watched a documentary about uh, gays and lesbians going into assisted living and how they have to go back into the closet. Can you imagine having to go back into the closet because less is still living, either the other people that live there or the people that run it are very conservative. 
So that's that has never even crossed my mind. Yeah, I didn't mind either until I saw this documentary called Jen Silent. So we like that's the storyline. So uh, George Takei and and the Bruce Valanche character, uh, ex lovers that still live together in Palm Springs, and then their friend Jerry's uh, twink, uh, who was Todd Sherry, a fifty year old twink, oh, wow. and uh, <laughs> they go to visit uh, um, Leslie Jordan on his birthday, and they bring like a penis uh, balloons and uh, ass cake, and they get there and they see Leslie Jordan being all butch. I'm like, what medication is he on? <laughs> and he says, I had to go back in the closet. Well, this sets off Bruce Blanche's character, which is kind of very political, like Dixie Carter, and gets him kicked out. And George Takei got kicked out of the army during the Don't Ask, Don't Tell, so that's his story. And he has a very powerful monologue in it saying, you know, like in the army, you don't leave any man on the field. We're family, Damn. so we have to be family. So they become a new kind of family. And, oh, yeah. Oh my God. So it's going to be very touching and real, and give a voice to you know we get to a certain age and you become invisible in the gay community, and oh. and we really want to be able to celebrate all those everybody. All right. Sadly, we've come to the end of my show. And I like oh. to end this with a silly little silly game, but uh, very easy. Don't even think about it. Necktie or bow tie? Necktie. Pee Wee Herman or Elvira? Well, he's my friend and he lives near here, so Pee Wee Herman. Mustache or beard? Say mustache. Tennis shoes or sneakers? What's the difference? What do you call them? Um, sneakers. Andy Cohen, Andy Cooper. Well, Andy Cohen only because I did a reality show and he was the executive on it. And he's a sweet man. I mean, always returns my email, so that's important. It is. Hardback, paperback. Paperback. Tony Orlando or Don? Tony Award. How about that? <laughs> Versace or Marc Jacobs? Um, Zach Posen. <laughs> Spring ahead or fall back? Uh, fall back because I love the fall. LAX or JFK? JFK, I love New York. Crunchy peanut butter or smooth? Smooth. White eggs or brown eggs? Egg whites. Silver Lake or WeHo? I lived in Silver Lake, so I have to say Silver Lake when I first moved in. Okay. Yogurt or cottage cheese? I hate both. <laughs> rooftop cocktails or poolside cocktails? Uh, rooftop. Sketch comedy or improv? Uh, they both scare the shit out of me. Bob Fosse, Stephen Sondheim. Fosse. I love it. He directs on the beat. I love that. Talk show host Oprah or actress Oprah? Talk show host. Pringles or Doritos? Pringles. I feel like neither. I feel like you just don't eat anything about it. And not now, but as a kid, I love that can. I love how they were all stacked. All right. This is this is like Sophie's choice for me. Okay. Aaron spelling 70s, Aaron spelling 80s, Aaron spelling 90s. Can I say uh, candy spelling? <laughs> uh, uh, I don't even know this word. Oh, Italian dressing or blue cheese? Italian. Oscar Wilde or Tennessee Williams? Uh, Tennessee Williams. Phyllis or Rhoda? Rhoda. Atlantic Coast or Pacific Coast? Atlantic Coast. You love that you're in New York. I'm in New York. All right, Diane Weist and Hannah and her sisters or Diane Weist and Bullets Over Broadway? Diane Weist and anything. Pop or soda? Either you Pop. Or appetizers or pop. Appetizers or desserts? Appetizers. I need that answer now. Stevie Nicks or Stevie Wonder? I'd like to see Stevie Wonder in a shawl <laughs> and a harmonica. You're the only gay person who hasn't answered Stevie Nicks like that. Really? Sorry. Yeah. Well, I'm from Detroit. Detroit. I'm did... from Detroit. You're right. So you're right. Like, you're right. right. Um, all right. You're directing a play, right? Yes, I am. Where can people see that? It's called Knife to the Heart. It's a comedy about circumcision. And it's uh, I co-wrote it with Christian McLaughlin, and I'm directing it. It's at the Dory Theater, part of the complex. Uh, we preview May 4th, we open May 5th, and we close May 20th. Only nine shows. Uh, Anne DeSalvo is in it, Chelsea Kane from Baby Daddy, Todd Sherry, and Josh Zuckerman. Uh, it's been optioned by a, a Chicago-based producer, and we're, this is our first step, and hopefully we're going to do Chicago next spring. But the goal is to get it to New York, and I'm very, very excited. And I love doing theater in L.A., and I want more people to be in it and to see theater in L.A. Well, after your new show wins... Thousands and thousands of Emmys and, and a Glad Award, off, a Glad something. Award, and every award. Please yeah. come back. Don't yeah. forget I the little people. To. Thank you so much for coming. Thank I really appreciate it. Thank you for letting me come. Yeah, exactly. Every week, right? Every week, I'm perfect. Thank you guys so much.